Father's Day. One of those times in which we set aside a theme in church to honor what God honors. God honors godly motherhood and godly fatherhood. And when we come to church, we expect that we will see the concept that we're talking about from God's perspective. This is why we go to church, to learn from God, to learn from God's Word, to see things in a way that the world is not going to show, to think in a way the world may not bring us to think. In fact, uh, we have to sometimes uh, contradict the world and reject the world in order to find out what is right. What is right is what God reveals. And we have a simple text this morning. We're going to talk about the value of fatherhood, and we find our text in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Very simple text. And ye fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, examine afresh and anew the biblical concept of godly fatherhood. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the Bible in some places where we are given instruction and exhortation it basically says this, don't, don't do this, but do, do this. Don't do the wrong thing, but instead do the right thing. Now the, the verse that we have, it's addressing fathers, and it's saying, don't do this, but instead do this. The implication is, is that it's possible to do it wrong. It, it, it's possible to not be a good father. It's possible to not be a good man. It's possible to not be a good person. So, provoke not your children unto wrath. In other words, don't create an atmosphere where your children are tense and angry and upset. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Both of these things, nurture and admonition. That is to love them and to guide them. To comfort them and, and, and give them uh, self-awareness and, 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 and love and all the things that help them to be good people. Nurture and admonition. You can't do one without the other and be a good father. Uh, you can't uh, say, well, I'll do the admonition part, but I'll leave all the nurturing up to mom. No fathers are to nurture as well. Uh, you can't say, well, I'm just going to be the fun dad and I'm not going to be the rules dad. Well, then you're neglecting your, your job as a father. You have to be the fun dad and the rules dad also. Sadly, there is actually serious debate in some sociological circles about whether or not fathers are even necessary. Uh, the modern feminist movement has taken upon itself uh, to remove the traditional roles of women and men and to try to create some kind of neutral uh, gender society uh, that robs men of their masculinity and robs women of their femininity uh, and therefore weakens both. Uh, some have gone to say that the influence of males in child rearing is itself a negative thing and that the best thing for children was to be, uh, would be to not have male influence in, in their lives. Uh, too much patriarchal influence, they say, causes aggressive tendencies and competitiveness. Uh, some have said men are too primal, too insensitive, too masculine, too something. For men to be beneficial, they say, men must develop more feminine traits. They must discover their feminine sides and learn better thinking. They must divest themselves of their dominant tendencies and develop a milder, gentler persona that will not warp the children by perpetuating the rule of males in society. They say such things and it is accepted. In fact, sadly enough, uh, the modern feminist movement, which is dominated by people who are, I think, to some degree or another, intellectually stunted, if not mentally ill and emotionally unbalanced, are in control of academia, in, true, in control of government uh, policy, and in control of much of our educational system. It's a sad thing when men are told that being a man is something negative and bad. Now, I understand it. Uh, men are problems. They always have been. Uh, when I was in school, uh, boys were problems. Uh, in fact, I felt it and I, I sensed it every day that I went to school. Uh, if there was upheaval, if there was turmoil, if there was chaos, if there was too much activity, the teacher wouldn't come in and say, okay, girls, calm down. 
they would say, okay, boys, it's time to calm down. And I admit it, it's boys. Uh, the boyish exuberance, the testosterone uh, party that was often uh, going on in junior high and high school is something that society has to deal with. But, but you, don't, uh, you don't help something by killing what is natural. You guide it. You recognize the value of it, and you create positive outlets for that which exists. Uh, it seems that many today uh, have tried to look at fatherhood and say it's a bad thing. And I've got a theory I've got a theory, and I believe I'm on it, that a lot of the man hatred today is really tied to a God hatred. It's tied to the idea of hating authoritarianism, hating someone who says there is a moral good and a moral evil, and I'm the one who says what's what, and therefore their rebellion against God, the Heavenly Father, has migrated down to anything that has the name Father. Let's understand something. There are two schools of thought that govern intellectuals today. There is revealed religion, as we find in the Bible and even in Judaism and to some degree even in Islam, the three monotheistic religions of the world. All of them have one solid thing in agreement that God is Father. He made man in His image and He gave him the ability to be leader in the home and in the religious institutions. God created the family unit. And as we read the Word of God, He made Adam. And then He said, I'm going to make a helpmeet for him, a compliment, uh, someone that will be his partner. And He made the first and only perfect woman. And she didn't stay perfect for long. He made the first and only perfect man. And he didn't stay perfect for long. So if you wonder why our society is messed up, it's because of our great-great-grandparents who had a perfect thing handed to them. And yet they sinned and rebelled against God. And we became now selfish, self-centered, problematic, in need of guidance. And the entire Bible is written to deal with that reality. Now God created the family unit. He created the idea of the father, the mother, and their children as the family. So to have a policy that fails to strengthen the family is to have a bad policy. In fact, to have a policy that weakens the family is to have a disastrous policy. Now there are several things that fathers provide. They have historically done this, and it's been something that has been a valuable asset. First of all, uh, identity. Identity. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God is speaking, and He said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now I read this verse to demonstrate that God called His people by His name. He is the Heavenly Father, and He called His people by His name. Now it has been true since ancient times that in all three of the monotheistic religions, as well as uh, most uh, the entirety of pagan religions and society in general, that the children bear the name of the Father. Most all countries and most all uh, nations and societies, with the exception of some few, few obscure uh, pagan matriarchies, pass on the Father's name as an identity to the children. Uh, in the Jewish world, it would be, you would be Bar Zebedee, which means you were the uh, Simon, the son of Zebedee. Or you would be Bar Jonah, the, the son of Jonah. Uh, in European society, uh, the very name, for instance, Stevenson, you were son of Stephen. Uh, and so the last name of the father was perpetuated upon the children. So identity is made uh, through the fathers. Now, in the home, there may be a, a father who is not as flamboyant, not as outward, not as noticeable, not as involved, and there may be a female, a mother, who is very much all of those things. But generally speaking, uh, when there is a home that is operating in the traditional sense, the father sets the tone. The father decides what's what. He decides where we're going to live, what we're going to do, uh, how we're going to do it, and he is in charge of that home. Uh, I think it's interesting that the more we see through uh, societies that were strong, that were prosperous, that had wealth, that were able to transfer wealth and able to do well, that most of them were dominated by the Father. Now I want to say quickly, because I think it's important to note, that I came from a fatherless home. 
My mother raised three children successfully without the benefit of a partner, and I know that it's tough, but it can be done. But society, as we will learn, if it proves one thing, it proves that fathers are important to society and their absence is very strongly felt. So I don't want to be out of balance today. Uh, we're not taking anything from motherhood when we talk about the value and the importance of fatherhood. But since fatherhood has come under such attack, I feel it necessary to defend it. So we should confess God's name and we should take the identity of the father. Also, the father provides provision provision. Now I believe with all of my heart that if there's only one thing a father can do, if there's one thing that he does and he doesn't do anything else, and he does this one thing, that's good. He provides for his family. He provides for his family. Maybe he doesn't entertain. Maybe he doesn't tell good dad jokes. Maybe he doesn't know how to take you out in the backyard and play catch. Uh, maybe he, he doesn't know how to fix things around the house. Maybe he doesn't know how to uh, cook. Maybe he doesn't know how to do a lot of things. But if he can do all that he can to provide the necessities for his family, at least that is something that is his basic duty to do. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, what the Bible is saying here is that if a man thinks he can be a Christian and neglect his responsibilities to his children, he's kidding himself. Even the pagans know to do that. Even the unbelievers know instinctively to do that. And a Christian must certainly do it to provide. Third, protection. Protection. There's a reason why men are taller and stronger and meaner on average than women. Now make no mistake about it, I've seen some pretty tall and some pretty strong and some pretty mean women out there. But I'm talking about on average. On average, men are about 50% stronger than women. And so if there is a threat made to the family unit, it is up to the man being biologically designed by God to be stronger, more able to fight, more able to take care of that kind of thing, to protect the family. We have a heavenly father who protects us, and we as fathers are to protect our family. This is a masculine trait, and it is, men have been called upon throughout human history to be the ones to go fight when fighting needed to be done to be the ones to resist attack when an attack was made. Now, by the way, let's, let's think about that. Some would say, well, all this fighting, all this fighting, it's just so unpleasant. It's just so bad. It's just so negative. We shouldn't have that. We shouldn't have boys learn to fight. We shouldn't have men who think like fighters. We shouldn't do that. And that, so we're going to raise them from the time they're little to, to not be aggressive, to not think in those terms, to, to not uh, be competitive and to not fight. And let's say you succeed at that. The problem is, did you do that to the society down the road? Did you do that to the society across the border? Did you do that to the society across the ocean? Because they still think in the old way. They still think they can attack. They still think they can make an attack. They still think of, about violence. Listen, until you change all of humanity to be passive and sweet and nice, you've got to have somebody who's prepared and able and willing to fight and resist aggression. It weakens a society when there's no one there who can make a defense. And this idea, wouldn't it be nice if everybody, were, if all the men were just like little girls? Well, that doesn't work because I guarantee you the people who come to attack you aren't going to be little girls. They're going to be strong, muscular, aggressive, uh, bold and daring men. And if you don't have the same kind of thing to meet that attack, you have now made a weak society. If one group of people is coming at you with spears and you are going at them with pillows, uh, guess who's going to win? If one group is coming to you with well-developed muscles and the other one is coming uh, with 40 pounds more weight than they need uh, and, 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 and no muscles to speak of, guess who's going to win? Uh, if one is coming to you 
with aggression and violence and the other one's coming with uh, reading poetry, uh, guess who's going to win? Uh, listen, the reality, folks, the reality of realities is we live in a competitive world. And if there's one thing that history has proven, you better be strong. You better be tough. You better be willing and able to fight when called upon to do so. Uh, make no mistake about it, some of God's most godly people that he ever worked with were warriors. They were people who were muscular. They were people who were strong. They were people who were tough. They were people who were able to draw a sword and do hand-to-hand -hand combat, trusting in God to give them the strength to do it, to defeat an enemy that God himself may have brought to them to test their mettle. Make no mistake about it. The sissification of a society is not the strengthening of a society. We need to understand that. So there is protection. A father also provides instruction. Uh, that is twofold. One, education on how to make a living. That's important. Men should work it out. And they should be very active in making sure that their children know how to make a living in this world. But secondly, and more important, is their religious training, their spiritual training, so that they will know how to live. And it would be better if you teach them how to live. They can figure out how to make a living if they know how to live. But if you teach them how to make a living, but you don't teach them how to live, you haven't done your job as a father. There is also the value of fatherhood is that of, of direction or leadership. The, the idea in leadership is that somebody has to be the leader. Somebody has to say, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, and if a man will not be the leader, uh, someone will be the leader, and maybe she will be a fine leader. Uh, I've often said this, and I believe it's true uh, in history, that, that sometimes the best man for a job is a woman. I look back through history, and I see some notable women who were great leaders. I think of Deborah in the Old Testament. Uh, she was a prophetess. God gave her revelations. God gave her wisdom. And uh, she was told to tell a general to get up an army and go to fight. And he said, well, I'm not going unless you go. And she said, okay, we'll all go. But when, when it's all over, a woman's going to get the credit for this battle and not a man. Don't tell me women aren't tough. They can be tough. And when they have to lead, they can lead well. I think of leaders like Indira Gandhi. Uh, I think of women like Margaret Thatcher, amen? Uh, I think of uh, that uh, gold of my ear. Uh, the, the world has been blessed with some very strong, courageous, and good and wise female leaders. But generally speaking, God has commissioned men to be leaders in the home and leaders in society. And therefore, direction is something that a father uh, should be involved in. Also, there is correction. Correction. Now that means there are times we have to say, okay, you can't do that. No, that was wrong. And uh, th this is the result of that wrong. Uh, men have to be involved in correction, and sometimes that involves discipline. Dads, I know that there are some dads who like to be the fun dad. I, I liked rather to be the fun dad. I, I would rather throw my kids up in the air and catch them uh, than to have to discipline them. But uh, it was something that God told me to do, I knew I needed to do, and so there were times I needed to be the heavy, and I took the role, and uh, tried to do my best with it, and be as fair as I can, and yet uh, accomplish it. Uh, but there must be correction, there must be discipline. And then it comes down to something that I think uh, fathers can provide as a value, is, is companionship, friendship. You know, just because your dad doesn't mean you can't be nice. Just because your dad doesn't mean you can't be somebody that they look forward to seeing. I, I think there's some men that go the other end, they go to the other direction, and they're all discipline, and they're all rules, and they don't know how to hug. They don't know how to say, I love you. They don't know how to talk to their child's heart. Uh, we need to have that balance of companionship. And you say, well, how does that work? How can you be the heavy? How can you be the parent? Well, you have to be balanced at it. Uh, one thing that I think uh, makes the balance is Jesus said uh, that uh, I've not called you servants, I've called you friends. And he says, if you do what I command you, you can be my friend. 
Now, that makes a lot of sense. I've thought about that, and I've thought about that, and I'd say, okay, what if I were to tell my son, son, I, I want you to go out and mow the grass. Uh, there was a little ritual I had when my son turned 10 years old. Uh, I took the family lawnmower, you know, your typical Briggs and Stratton push mower, and I got a, a bottle of, of paint, you know, and I wrote his name on it, Daniel, right across it. You see, because I used to mow the grass, and he had a little toy uh, lawnmower that put out bubbles. You know, we could put a little fluid in it, and he would push that thing around, and he'd go, and he'd make the noises, and, and it'd blow bubbles out. And so I'd be cutting the grass, and he'd be following me, uh, pushing his little lawnmower. Well, when he turned 10, I swapped with him. You know, you, you can mow this one, and I'll, I'll push the little one. No, but... But I said, okay, son, here's the thing. This lawnmower is now yours. I'm giving it to you. You own this lawnmower. But now you also own the upkeep of it. Uh, you're responsible for it. And you can take it down the, the neighborhood if you want. And you can cut other people's lawns for money. But here's the deal. Uh, ownership of this lawnmower means that now you're the family lawn uh, boy. You're, you're going to cut the grass. So let's say I said, son, uh, it's time to cut the grass. And he'd say, oh, dad of mine, I love you so much. You're the best dad. You're a friend of mine. I talk to all the other people in the world about how good a dad you are. But he doesn't go out and cut the grass. And I'd say, well, son, that's nice you said all that. But, you know, I, I, I want you to go out and cut the grass. And he said, oh, dad of all dads, the bringer home of the bacon, the sitter in the easy chair, uh, the man who causes us all to have joy when the sun rises in the morning and when the sun shuts at night, the man who makes us feel all comfortable. Thank you for being my dad. I'd say, well, that's fine, son. That's all poetic and nice, but I want you to cut the grass. You see, we're going to have an impasse because you see, uh, to, to, to honor me as father it is not to say words. It's to do what I said when I said to do it. Now, God is that way. When we come to Him to worship, when we come to Him to praise His name, but we're not obeying Him, we're not doing what He said to do, we are not being as we should be. Uh, it's important, first of all, that we obey, and then secondly, that we enjoy the Lord. Now, the unique attributes that are hardwired into men are those attributes that are necessary for a strong family and a strong society. When boys grow up to be husbands and fathers, here's what happens to them. They learn to think of others. Now that's a big step for a boy. That's a big step for a young man because previous to that, they mostly think about themselves. And a man has not matured until he begins to think about others, about his own family, about society in general, about what's right uh, and so these attributes that a man has are brought to their strongest point when a man commits himself to the improvement and betterment and, and blessing of others. Now, a society that rewards that role will be a strong and healthy society. A society that attacks and erodes and weakens that role in society will be one that decays. There are statistics, great statistics, that bear this out uh, in many ways. Uh, I want to read just a few of them. Uh, this is an article by Joshua A. Krish, and he talks about the father effect. The father effect. And these are statistics that are drawn from society, and they are so powerful because uh, of, of several reasons. One of which is it doesn't matter who takes the statistics, they all bear out the same thing. And it doesn't matter how you interpret them, it all points to the same conclusions. Uh, also, there is sometimes in statistics the question of whether it's a, a correlation or causation. But the enormity of these statistics and the, the variance, uh, the, the difference in the variance is so strong that causation is mandated in the interpretation of this. Let me uh, just read a few things, okay? Uh, first of all, uh, according to the data, children with involved fathers, children with involved fathers are less likely to break the law and drop out of school. Guided by close relationships with their dads, these kids disproportionately grow up to avoid sexual promiscuity. 
They generally uh, pursue healthy relationships and hold down higher paying jobs. They're unlikely to become homeless or rely on welfare and more likely to have higher IQ scores than their peers by age three. Longer term, they suffer from fewer psychological problems and may be less prone to obesity. Now, we're going to flesh out this in some details in some categories so that we understand what is called the father effect. Here's some statistics. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. That's five times the average. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. This is 32 times the average. In other words, the lack of a father makes one 32 times more likely to be homeless or a runaway. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the average. 80% of rapists come from fatherless homes. That's 14 times the national average. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. That's nine times the average. Children with fathers who are involved are 40% less likely to repeat a grade in school. Children with fathers who are involved are 70% less likely to drop out of school. Children with fathers who are involved are more likely to get A's in school. Children with fathers who are involved are more likely to enjoy school and engage in extracurricular activities at school. 75% of all adolescent patients in uh, chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. That's, the t that's 10 times the average. 70% of youths in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. That's nine times the average. And then finally, 80% of all youths in prison come from fatherless homes. 20 times the average. These are statistics that bear out what we know from the Bible and what we know from common sense that a family that has a father present and involved has a better chance of the kids turning out healthy and well-adjusted and strong than those who do not. Now, I didn't make those statistics up. I just read them. And it doesn't matter if you're liberal. It doesn't matter if you're uh, conservative. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation with is. Uh, these are numbers. These are society's numbers. These, these tell the truth. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that by the grace of God, a woman who has no father in the home can still raise godly children because God is bigger than statistics. Amen? But it also means that a society that fails to promote the, in, the inclusion of fathers is taking a big risk, is making a big mistake. Uh, if statistics show that having this in society makes society stronger, then we should reward that, not punish it. We should encourage it, not discourage it. And yet we live in a time today, sadly, when there are governmental policies in place that actually reward fatherless homes and increase fatherlessness. When LBJ, when uh, President Johnson uh, imposed his great society and began to, uh, to bring in money uh, to, for uh, uh, welfare purposes, here's what would happen. Here's how it was done. They would have people go door to door. They would have people go household to household. And here it is. If there was a father in the household, they got nothing. But if there was no father in the household, they got all kinds of government money. And this amount has increased throughout the years to where I'm not making this up and I'm not exaggerating. There, there are young women who have chosen as a career to be in a single parent home because they can live better and have more things to enjoy if they don't marry the father of their children than if they do. And this has caused uh, the single parent homes uh, to become more numerous. It has caused the father, uh, the homes with fathers in them to become less. Uh, and that has weakened our country and it has reached a state uh, where we cannot even afford it. It's, it's breaking the bank. Uh, so uh, what we ought to be doing uh, is to say, if you have fathered a child, it is your responsibility to provide for that child, and you will do so even if we have to garnish your wages to do it. Uh, there should be an incentive for men to step up to the plate and to provide for their own actions. And there should be a disincentive for people to uh, have uh, children out of wedlock. 
Now, I believe that we need to recognize the positive influences of loving, selfless masculinity. And yet all you hear about today is this term, toxic masculinity. Masculinity is toxic. Now, now what they're saying is this, men are poison. Now, it's true that some men are poison, just as some women are poison. But the way it's being said today is that masculinity itself is an infection. Masculinity itself is a, is a pathogen. It's something that we need to address, something that we need to eradicate, something we need to deal with. Uh, folks, I want to I be honest with you as I know how to be. As a man of God and as a student of society, we're not being poisoned by too much masculinity in this country. We're being poisoned with effeminacy in this country. We're being poisoned with men who have become effeminate. We are being poisoned with men who are no longer men, who no longer think like men, who no longer behave like men. That's what's poisoning our society. That's what's injuring it. That's what's hurting it. That's what's causing it to regress. We would be much better off if we had more masculine men who were tied to the long-term interest of a family and to the Word of God to live as a man of God would live, but to keep his masculinity intact. The statistical evidence that comes from multiple sources tells us that men play a vital role in society, and when men become weak, society becomes weak. What are the contributions that a godly father can make to our society today? I'll tell you, show up. Show up. Be there. One time a man came to me, and he was sincere as he could be. Uh, he, he was living in a nice house, driving a, a nice new car, uh, living a middle to upper middle class lifestyle. And yet he had a, a former wife uh, who he had been divorced from and a couple of children uh, in town that he no longer lived in their home. He had remarried and rebuilt his life. But he came to me for advice about how to get out of paying child support. He could not have come to anyone else who would have been worse for him. He could not have picked a counselor that would be less likely to give him encouragement than he came to me. I grew up in a fatherless home. I remember seeing my mother cry over the family's bills at the linoleum, linoleum table. Uh, I can remember seeing her chin quiver and her bottom lip uh, out and the tears come down her face because there was no child support. I can remember feeling that. I can remember the anger. I can remember the sadness. I can remember the hurt. And at the same time, uh, this man who was living pretty well and the other family, which I had seen, were living in a mobile home in town and, and not living well at all. And I didn't know all the other things about it. I don't know why they separated. It was none of my business, but I do know this. Those kids needed their child support. Those kids should have it. And so he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, move into a cardboard box if you have to. Ride a bicycle to work if you have to. Eat bologna every day if you have to. Sell everything you have if you have to, but pay your child support. Are there any other questions? And he knew I meant it when I said it. I said it in love. And I said it as a pastor ought to say it. Don't you come to a man of God and try to get permission to neglect the responsibility of your children. Don't come to me and expect you to give a, a, a thumbs up to making sure that they don't have the things that even the court said you ought to pay to them. I believe with all of my heart that the best thing that men can do in society is to work hard, show up, give of yourself, and here's what I believe society ought to do in return. Say thank you. Say keep it up. Say we're glad you're doing that. 
Say, we're going to cause it to where you are honored and you are respected and you are seen as valuable to society. Why would anyone look at men and say that you're toxic? Why would anyone look at fathers and say you're unnecessary unless there was a satanic effort to weaken a society to the point that anybody could walk in and take them over? Now, I know that there's some bad men out there. And I know there's some fathers out there that maybe it would be better if they weren't even around their kids. They're so bad. But that being said, there is too much effort and too much energy being placed today on trying to effeminize men and make them less than what God himself and nature itself created him to be. You know, back in the day, back in the day when societies operated in a way that recognized the different roles that boys and girls have and men and women have, the girls learned from their mothers how to prepare them for life. They learned by watching. They learned by assisting. They learned by teaching. They learned from their mothers how to prepare themselves for life. And boys learned from their fathers how to be a man, how to be a good man, uh, what to expect, how to prepare for it, how to work, how to be disciplined, how to say no, uh, to the old nature, how to achieve something worth uh, ad admiring. Uh, men often would learn, would teach their sons uh, at their uh, family job, at their craft, at whatever they did so that they would be prepared for it. Here's what I think has happened to American society, Western society in general, is we take boys away from their fathers, away from the masculine influence, and from kindergarten all the way through grade school, maybe even in the junior high and high school, they are dominated by women. But not only that, women who are dominated by feminist philosophy and boys grow up thinking, there's something wrong with me. There's something sick about me. There's something about me that's bad. And that's the impression they get. Listen, the worst possible thing you can do to a human being is to make them feel inferior, to make them feel bad, to make them feel like they can't make a good contribution, to make them feel like their future is limited and their prospects is limited. That is the worst thing you can do for anybody. Girls are boys. Men are women. And it doesn't matter what race, economic level, doesn't matter any of that. It's true for everything. Listen, here's what God wants us to do. God wants us to take who we are and learn from His Word so we can be better. I was an angry young man for too long. As a boy, I had some problems. I, as a boy, I had some problems. I did that thing that some children do that's, that's not smart. It, it, it doesn't make sense, but I did it. And a lot of kids do it. Because my father wasn't around, I thought it must be me. It must be me. Maybe I wasn't good. Why is it my father doesn't want me to be his little boy anymore? Why is it he's not around? Why is it he's not with us? Uh, as a boy, your thinking is limited. Uh, and so I thought it couldn't be my little brother or my little sister. They're little. They're, it must be me. And I grew up feeling guilty. I, I grew up feeling bad. Uh, I grew up feeling rejected. I was angry. I was angry. And I showed out. And I was craving attention. I was craving meaning and identity. And I went about it all the wrong way. And I was a behavior problem. Yeah. I got paddled a lot. I misbehaved a lot. I made up lies about my father. You know, because other of my friends had fathers, and so I, I wanted to make up lies why he wasn't around. And so the saddest lie, the saddest lie ever told, my, my dad had been a, a pilot in, in the Air Force. And you know, when you're a kid and you watch TV, you have no perception of time. And so when I was watching a World War II movie or documentary, for all I knew, all that was happening right now. 
And so I said, well, the reason my dad's not around, you understand, is he's out there fighting the Japanese. He's shooting down those zeros. He's in his airplane, and he's out there shooting the Japanese. That's why he's not around. And so anybody who heard that would, would have to know then, well, even though we've been at peace with Japan for many years, that Leverett boy's dad is still out there shooting at the Japanese. Uh, I said to some, I would say, my dad, really, you see, the reason he's not around, he's a secret agent. He's in disguise. And, you know, he could be anywhere. He, he could be over there, but we wouldn't know because he's in disguise. I would say things like that. And I didn't know whether to laugh now looking back or cry, but it was a sad thing that I was trying to say, I have a dad too. I have a dad that loves me, and the only reason he's not here is because he's a hero or something else. But really, down in my heart, I, I felt the reality. I felt the rejection and the anger. And this carried me on into my teenage years. I, I dealt with it, and finally, I came to know Jesus. Jesus saved me. I was under conviction about my sin. I came to Jesus. I got saved and so my soul was saved, my spirit was quickened, I was able to go to heaven, but there was still some stuff in my emotions, there was still some stuff in my brain that God had to deal with. So, it wasn't long after I got saved, I said to my little brother, I said, you know Galen, I said, let's go, let's go camping, we'll just go in the backyard, we'll just pitch a tent in the backyard and we'll sleep out in the backyard, we'll go camping. We'll build us a little fire here, and we'll go camping. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray to my new father. I'm going to pray to my new heavenly father. I'm, I'm going to just pray and talk to my father in heaven. You want to do that? And he said, yeah, let's do that. And so we did. We camped out, and we prayed a little bit. And then we sat, and the flaps of the tent were open, and we looked up into the stars. And maybe it was a coincidence. I don't know. But one shooting star right after another. It must have been the Perseid meteor shower. I don't know what it was. But the sky was filled with shooting stars. And I watched it. It was like the 4th of July. God was putting on a display. And I looked at it, and I was in awe. And I was in euphoria. And I was saying, wow, that's really something. And I happened to be right here for the show. And I felt like God was smiling on me. God loves me. God cares about me. Later, I went through a tough day at school. Felt like all the teachers hated me. Looking back, I don't blame them. And on my bed at night, I began to feel bad. I began to feel bad. And my little brother was sleeping just across on the other side of the room, and I didn't want him to hear me crying, but I was crying. And I was crying quietly so he wouldn't hear me, but tears were coming out of my eyes, and I felt bad. I just felt bad. And I said to myself, why doesn't my daddy love me? I was 13 by now, still struggling with that thing. Why doesn't my daddy want me? And listen, looking back, it was so unfair, so unfair to tag him with that. He was something like 26 years old when all that happened. I, so wrong to tag him with all of that angst I was feeling. It wasn't all, it was complicated. And yet, in my mind, that's how I felt. And I, I had my, my hands on my own pajamas, and, and I was holding them like that, and I was crying. And all of a sudden, a thought came to me from God. And it was as real as if he said it, and I heard it. I'm your father. I'm your father. And a peace came over me. And I thought, I have a father. I have a father. And he's perfect. He never makes mistakes. And he loves me wonderfully. And he even came to earth and died for me so I could go to heaven and live with him forever. And he wants me. He wants me where I can be with him. And until then, he's got a job for me to do. I can make a contribution. I can do some stuff. <laughs> I can enjoy some life. And I made up my mind. I made up my mind as a teenage boy that if God should ever bless me with children, if God should ever give me a family, I was going to work hard and I was going to provide for them whatever it took and I was going to be with them there and do the best I could to show them that I love them so they know it. God gave me two children. 
And I was imperfect in many ways. But I was there. Today, my kids sent me a hilarious Father's Day video. I didn't record it. I didn't play it until I got to church. And I, I pushed the little arrow on that thing and the, the screen on my phone filled up and it was the funniest Father's Day thing. It was William Shatner singing, I want to stand up and shout with my name in lights in the background. And somehow, I don't know how they did it. They actually got him to say my name. I was impressed by that. It blew me away. But here's what was behind it. My kids wanted me to laugh. My kids wanted me to feel good. They wanted wanted me to know that they loved me and they wanted me to have a good day on my day. Listen, I want to tell you something. I don't know what your background is. I don't know if you have emotional trauma for an absent father or a bad father. I don't know if you've got sweet memories from a wonderful father. I don't know what your background is. But I do know this. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter how messed up your family was or how messed up you are, you have a heavenly Father who loves you and wants to include you and has some stuff for you to do that you can praise Him with and He wants you to have a good life. The Bible says this in John chapter 1, verses 11 13. He came unto His own and His own received Him not, but as many as received Him... Speaking of Jesus, as many as received him to to them, gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. What the Bible is saying here, no matter what else happens, it's God's will that if you will receive him, he will receive you. And he will let you be in his family and you can be his child. Dear Father, I pray that on this special day our fathers will feel appreciated because they are. Thank God for our godly fathers who stepped up to the plate and did what was right, who stayed with it and provided and protected and loved and nurtured. Lord, I pray that our society would recognize fatherhood instead of despise it and they would increase godly masculinity rather than try to dismantle that which God and and, and, and nature itself has provided. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be strong and to make good decisions. And Lord, for anybody out there who is yet to make life's most important decision to come to Christ by faith, I pray that this would be their day to do so. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.